Hey guys, so uh, thanks for having me at FITC. It's really great to be back in Toronto. Obviously, I'm going to be talking a lot about creative coding and generative art. This is kind of a passion of mine, and I wanted this talk to be pretty high level. Uh, pretty much just how do you get into this kind of space? Uh, what are the ways you can find inspiration? What kind of art and what kind of projects are going on? And also some of the tools and some of the techniques that I'm using in my own workflow as an artist to create this kind of work. So when I talk about creative coding, I'm talking about using code for something expressive rather than for something functional. So it's maybe creating an image or an artwork uh, or something just fun and playful and creative, uh, but it's still using code and, and using computation. Here's a little example, the most basic example I can try and create. And you're basically just saying, hey computer, draw something maybe red, draw a circle, draw a square, and then draw something else you're giving it instructions, and then the computer is actually running those instructions to produce an artwork or an image or something like that. That's just a simple example. And then when I say generative art, I'm talking about making a machine, a machine that actually makes art. So, for example, creating an autonomous system that uh, every time it runs, it produces a new artwork or a new image or some sort of uh, manifestation. Here's that same simple example, but using generative, uh, a generative function. Maybe every time it runs, it produces a different image. So here it is again, and every time it runs, it just produces a different image, a different artwork. So I'll start by just talking about some projects that I am really inspired by, and just the different types of things that you can actually see in generative art and creative coding. So this one's a really good example. It's called Substrate by Jared Tarbell. And the idea is really simple. You draw lines that are extending outwards uh, to infinity, but when they collide with other lines, it creates a new line at a perpendicular angle. And with those simple set of rules, you can create these really complex and really intricate results. This is just a video that's looping, but if you actually were to see the program running on the computer, every time it runs, it would produce a new image. And that's kind of the exciting thing about generative art, is that every time it runs, it produces something that's unique and totally different than anything it's ever produced before it. Here's another uh, example, is uh, Field.io. You can actually check them out. They're a London-based studio. They do lots of great work, and they quite often work with generative systems. Uh, th in this case, they're taking the neurons that are firing in a neural network in machine learning, and they're trying to map that into these, uh, these visual systems, like an illustration or an animation that creates these really high-fidelity graphics. And then this is a nervous system. Jessica spoke yesterday. It was a really cool talk. And she talked all about her work uh, in nervous system and how they produce these physical forms from generative algorithms. A lot of the time they're modeling natural phenomena. So you can imagine the way that a coral reef might grow. And they're taking algorithms and code and they're actually forming these real products. Puzzles, homeware, jewelry, uh, and entire textile fabrics uh, using 3D printing and, and fabrication. Here's another example. It's a really cool cop. I really happy to have bought one, um, and it's uh, based on brain coral. And here's the actual simulation, and you can see that when the simulation is finished, you have the final product, but every time the simulation runs, you're gonna get a new and unique cup. So this is uh, on Formative, it's a Berlin-based studio that works a lot with generative, a lot with creative coding. And this is kind of cool, I thought, just because it takes uh, an image, but it boils it down to uh, on, off, so light or shadow, or true or false. This binary system where you're either having a pixel that's lit or not lit. And instead of a pixel, it's actually this uh, physical component that just spins. And it creates these really beautiful patterns, and it's emergent and generative, and it's always changing and always producing these new forms and shapes. And so it's just a cool way to take uh, the concepts of generative art and creative coding, but instead of mapping them to images with pixels, you're actually bringing them to the real world with these physical components. And then one more studio that's working a lot in this space is United Visual Artists, UVA. And here's an example of one of their projects that I thought was really cool. Uh, you can actually see it's these slats that look like they're sort of projection map with, uh, with light going through trees or something like that. But if you actually walk around it, you see that it's just these little tiny LEDs. And these LEDs are programmed to spark and light in different ways uh, in sort of this ever-changing emergent pattern. And so this would also be using some sort of generative system that moves the, the light around and moves the shapes. And then this one is just fun and playful. It's on the web, you can check it out. And when you mute it. Uh, 
Yeah, and so I like to show this because it's uh, generative art and creative coding isn't so serious all the time. Uh, you can just have playful, fun experiments, uh, especially in the web space with advertising and branding. This is a huge thing where a lot of people are working with WebGL uh, to make these kind of quirky experiments. So I'll just start by uh, talking a bit about my early learnings. Sorry, I said early learnings. Um, I sort of got into this in 2014. Uh, I worked on this little demo called Generative Impressionism, uh, just using JavaScript, front-end technologies, and the web, and Canvas. And what I did was I just moved particles around with a noise function, and every time the particle moved, it took from a, a photograph, it sampled a pixel and the color, and it starts to create this almost oil painting type of thing. And this is all just running in the web browser. And here is where I realized that I can actually use code, and I can use the skills I was learning with programming and with front-end and I could use that to create art, and maybe one day I'd be able to create art that actually would be exhibited, or I'd be able to show it somewhere, or hang it on a wall, or print it at a large scale. And so that was a really cool revelation, to be able to use code to, to create art. Uh, and then fast forward a few years. In 2017, I purchased a mechanical pen plotter. And this is where I really started to dive into things. This is what a pen plotter looks like. It's a mechanical device, like a robotic device, where you attach a pen to the end of the arm, and that pen will get moved around in a very specific way based on how you program it and based on how you send those commands and the movements to the device. And so here's how it actually looks once it's printed out something. This particular print is uh, visualizing the mag magnetic sphere of the Earth uh, using sort of a generative algorithm that maps that to a sphere. And one of the interesting things about pen plotters and how it relates to code is that you can create these generative algorithms, and every time you run this algorithm, you get a new result, and you can map that to commands that would be uh, sent to the, the actual pen plotter, and then the, the pen plotter can just print it out, and it's never gonna get tired of printing out new generations. And so it has this nice, uh, this nice match with, with creative coding and generative art. Also, the cool thing is, because it's an actual pen, sometimes the pen will, will lose ink and it'll dry up, and sometimes it'll catch an edge, and so you get this really unique print that really feels like it's been made by a human, but it's, but it's been made by a robot, so there's kind of this weird like, uh, mix, almost like human-robot kind of collaboration. Here's how it looks, and here's how it sounds. It's really therapeutic just to watch it as it's going. You can just spend like an hour watching it print out your thing. So yeah, this is all created with JavaScript. Um, using the same skills that I was using before with web development to actually learn how to create artwork that uh, gets transformed into prints. And at the time, I didn't find many resources on using JavaScript to produce these kind of works. So I created a tool called Penplot. You can find it still on GitHub. It's a bit deprecated now because I've got another tool, which I'm going to talk about later, which is kind of the upgrade of this. But it was just a development environment that allowed me to iterate really quickly uh, and produce all sorts of different results. So this is me over nine months or so, 900 or so different images. All of the images are exported from the same pen plot tool. And in each uh, image, you're just seeing either a new generation or new algorithm, uh, and me exploring these different algorithms, different ideas, uh, all sort of generative systems. And one of the interesting things about this sort of chronological timeline is that you can start to see colors, you can start to see shapes, and that's because the way I'm using the tool is evolving. The way that I'm uh, exploring this, this pen plot tool I'm no longer just creating pen plots, I'm actually sometimes producing images that you cannot re reproduce with a pen plotter. So sometimes I'm adding colors and fills and, and you'll start to see some more colorful outputs. And uh, yeah, this is just me evolving and changing the tool. And the more I started to tweak this tool, the more I started to realize it's actually just a useful tool for any purpose of, of creative coding and generative art. Uh, and it was kind of a nice learning, which I'll get into. But uh, during this time, this is sort of my favorite four um, outputs from this like, sort of nine-month period where I was experimenting with the pen plotter. And I started to think maybe my style is beginning to develop as an artist. Maybe this is sort of beginning to be my style. But then I also, at the same time, I was uh, creating work with Blender, uh, doing these 3D models and 3D renders. And all of a sudden, the outputs, they felt very different. And they didn't feel like they had uh, any similarity with, with the other work I was creating. And I started to realize that the tools that I'm using and the tools that uh, I'm working with to create these images is really going to shape my style as an artist. 
And so in order to break out of a certain style, or in order to further refine my style and further develop it, I really needed to hack my tools and modify my tools. And so that's been a thing that I'm really focusing on, is how can I take my tools, experiment with them, hack them, break them, uh, and change them and produce new work from these modifications. And this is kind of an example of that. This Crystal Towers print series, um, it's, uh, it's 10 different cities, and each one, and one of them is Toronto, New York, etc. Each one is the uh, skyscraper heights in that city mapped to the, these generative crystal structures uh, that are then forming these sort of renders. And this is sort of what it looks like up close. And so it's a data-driven sort of generative piece. Um, but the, the interesting thing for me was exploring how can I take this, uh, this same workflow that I've been creating over these nine months working with this pen plotter and working with this, these tools, but how can I modify it and hack it and change it in different ways? And so in this case, I used the same pen plot tool, but I actually exported an OBJ file instead of a file for the pen plotter. Uh, so this file was just something that uh, you can bring right into Blender, you can bring it into Cinema 4D or anything, and actually create a render. And so I started to just modify my workflow, hack my tools, and it really changed the way that uh, my art looked and sort of changed my style a bit. So that was just a nice lesson during that time. Now, in terms of finding inspiration, this has like, become a really big part of my work as well, is just trying to find uh, inspiration and trying to find new ways of, of working and new ways of thinking about, of, about my work and about creative coding and generative art. Uh, and it all started, of course, with like, Pinterest and looking for different mood boards and inspiration and things like that. I've really started like, cataloging all the different styles I like. Uh, here's like a risograph print board where I talk about like, or I like put together all the different images that I like that have to do with risograph colors. Uh, but actually when I was doing this, I started to not really be satisfied with Pinterest because you can't really find the artist names. So yeah, I was actually like taking the image, putting it into like TinEye or Google image search to try and find who the artist is. Uh, and eventually I started to find these communities. So this is Plotter Twitter on Twitter and it's a hashtag but it's full of these people that are posting these, uh, these beautiful tweets and videos of them working with their plotters and working with generative art, and they're creating stuff like this. Uh, but they're not just creating uh, art with plotters, they're also making plotters. They're using Raspberry Pis and hacking it together. It's this sort of whole little, like, little mini culture, mini subculture, niche community, super niche. There's not very many people doing it. But it's, it's cool to see, and some of them are actually taking old plotters from like the 70s and hacking those to do to use JavaScript or use Python or something new that didn't exist when these plotters were around. But one of the cool things is, as I was following this community, not only was I finding new artists, but I was also, uh, the community itself was beginning to build, and now there's actually like a meetup that happened in San Fran, where tons of these people that were just following this hashtag, they got together, they started swapping prints, they started selling and sort of exhib exhibiting their work, and also talking about how to like make it and all the techniques and stuff. And they're going to be doing another one in New York, and now there's talk that maybe they're going to bring it to like London. And it's, it's just cool to see this kind of uh, little mini hashtag is growing this kind of community out of nowhere. And from this hashtag and from this kind of community, uh, there's Andrews Hoff in Convergent, who's creating tons of beautiful work, quite often with pen plotter, where he's creating these generative systems, a little bit similar to nervous system uh, and Jessica, working with uh, natural phenomena like coral reef growth and that kind of thing. And then another artist that was really inspiring through this whole process was Johnny Le Mercier. And Johnny Le Mercier, he's, uh, he's not always working with pen plotters, but this is where I started to find his work. He creates these really beautiful landscape uh, works, and he actually went as far as to bring a pen plotter in his backpack in the desert and uh, like print these things out on site in the desert, so he's really into that. Uh, but then he, I started to see his other work, which was more light installation. And so this is, uh, this is light projected on a volumetric mist of particles, water particles. And seeing this was, was crazy, thinking this guy is doing pen plotter work and now he's also working in light installations that are massive on this like, massive scale. So it's really inspiring to see that and to realize that uh, with the skills that I'm learning, I can also transfer into this kind of space. I can use my generative art and my creative coding and I can bring that into this kind of installation space, this public art space. Another person uh, that was really inspiring because my work was so far very black and white was uh, Manolo Gambon Noun, who's doing processing and 2D and really colorful, rich patterns, very generative, very abstract. 
Uh, but one of the cool things that's coming out of this little Twitter community of generative artists is that there's now an exhibition that's going to be happening in May in Zurich uh, that's going to bring together a couple of these uh, processing and, and sort of generative artists as well as highlight some of the work that's been done since the 60s and beyond then that sort of uh, was the pioneering work. Uh, and this kind of leads me to my next thing, which is actually going to exhibitions and how that's also changed my work. So Vera Molnar, her work is... Uh, is really, it's very similar because she was working with pen plotters and she was working with code and she was working with computation in the 60s and 70s uh, before this stuff was very accessible. And it's amazing to see her work and realize that it's not that different than what we're creating now in this little tiny community. Uh, and also to see it in person and to see it in a museum, see it appreciated by some of these uh, art, actual art institutions and see it sort of preserved in a frame uh, for all these years. Another artist, as I was going to museums and exhibitions, I started to find Soluit. And Soluit, I thought, was most interesting because he's not actually working with code. He's not working with generative art, but it's so similar uh, that it's so related that there's a lot of uh, interesting ideas to be found in his work. And so, for example, he's creating these wall murals. And he created these in the 70s and beyond, and he's created hundreds of them. And they're huge, and they're in museums and galleries and concert halls, etc. And yeah, his work is, is just uh, is really pretty and really fascinating. But if you look at it all, you start to think it's almost like algorithmic. It's almost like based on a system of rules and logic. It's almost like it's been done with code, but it's not been done with code. Uh, and actually, this one, this particular mural, his entire process wasn't to paint the mural, and he doesn't paint the mural by hand. Instead, he just has the instructions. And so his contribution here, his part of the art, is to say, Rectangles formed by three inch wide India ink bands meeting at right angles. And that is, is his art, is the instruction, this one sentence. He hands that sentence off to the builders, to the fabricators, and they actually end up producing this mural. And it's almost like generative art in a way uh, with creative coding, where we're creating these instructions for the computer. Uh, we're setting out uh, commands and instructions, and the computer is the one implementing them. But in his case, with his art, He's creating instructions that are then implemented by the builders, by the fabricators, by other humans. And it's just there's a lot of parallels in his work, and it's really fun to also try and reproduce some of his instructions uh, word for word and, and try and act as the, the implementer of his instructions using code, using JavaScript, uh, just to sort of refigure that and to, to try that again with, with modern processes. Speaking of processes... Um, I'll just talk a little bit, because now I've been chatting a bit about how I got into it and like, some of the inspiration. I want to talk a bit about um, how do you actually like, create these things and how do they actually come out from, from nothing, or how do, they, how do these images come out from a system. And so I'll just break down this really simple uh, looking sort of very grid-like uh, structures. And if you're a developer, or even if you're not, you might recognize these. They might look familiar. Uh, they're known as sort of tree maps or quad trees or oak trees. Um, but it's these, uh, these sort of divided grids, and how do we actually create images like this, and how would they come about? So let's say we have a, a blank page, and we take the width of the page, and we just divide that by three. And then we mark a line, just like that. And we do the same thing, but now we have two boxes, and so we're going to take the bigger of the two boxes, and instead of doing the width, we're going to do the height, we're going to divide the height by three. We mark another line. And now we have another two boxes. So we take the bigger of those two boxes, we divide it again, but we alternate width, height, width, height, width, height. Each time we alternate, and each time we just take the bigger of the two boxes, divided by three. You end up with an image like this. Every time you set those uh, rules and parameters, you're going to get the same image. So what if you actually change the system so that it's random? Every time you're not using the same rules, not the same parameters, but you're introducing randomness. Sometimes you're using a third, sometimes you're using less, sometimes you're using a, a larger fraction, and sometimes you're alternating width and height, but randomly, width, width, height, height, etc. And that's how you create an image like this, or like this, or like that. And these are simple images, and it's a simple system, and a lot of creative coders are experimenting with these same systems. It's not, uh, it's not new, really, or anything like that. But it's uh, such a simple system that you can use it in such a variety of ways. And so it's something that appears in a lot of my work, and this whole concept of just dividing and subdividing and recurs recursion 
uh, is something that you can really take advantage of with a computer that's a little bit harder by hand. So here's just an example of uh, one of my works that's just subdividing layer by layer. You can see it's like drilling down smaller and smaller. And you'll start to see this pattern exists in not just my own work, but a lot of creative coders. We seem to like recursion, so there's a lot of it. And here it is again, the same sort of concept, breaking this page up using, uh, in this case, it's using like golden ratio instead of dividing it by three, and it's using arcs. There's the final print. And then here's just another one where instead of it being a, on a perfect grid, it's a little bit offset. And the same concept is being used here. And it's not actually using squares and rectangles anymore. It's just dividing this, this uh, shape into smaller and smaller pieces. And this is all kind of going back to what I was finding with SoloID is that you just start with a simple set of instructions. And from that simple set of instructions, you can produce these really complex results. And it kind of reminds me also of Jared Tarbell's, like that original line thing I was showing you. Um, and it's, it's just really nice to actually see this kind of thing emerge from some, such a simple set of rules and simple set of parameters. And also the cool thing is that it's so flexible. These algorithms, once you create it, you can uh, sort of recreate it in different ways. You can manipulate it. And so the same algorithm that was just this one here, all of a sudden now you use the third dimension and you have a 3D shape. You could 3D print this. You could use later laser cutting to actually create this in the physical space. So how do you actually go about doing these kind of works? So I use my own framework. A lot of people use processing or Python or whatever. Uh, this is my own framework. I like to use JavaScript and the web. I like to have my things uh, on the web so I can share them as a website if I want to. And this is called Canvas Sketch. Um, you can check it out on GitHub. It has lots of documentation. It's a little bit better suited for those who know JavaScript already. Uh, but hopefully, even if you don't, maybe you could tinker with it. Maybe not. But the idea that I wanted to, to get at is this idea of sketching with code. So I'd like to be able to just open my notebook and start drawing things out. Uh, but I want to be able to do that with code instead of a pencil. And so these are like some of the sketches that I was creating with this tool. And this whole time, I've just been hacking that pen plot tool that I was talking about and just modifying it uh, and changing it to produce these new tools. And so this is just a successor to that original tool. It's the same, same concept. It's just no longer exporting pen plotter prints, it's exporting any type of print you want, whether it's a ink print or a silkscreen print or a physical 3D print or some other shape or some file that could be sent to a laser cutter or a CNC mill. Another kind of technical aspect of this tool, just uh, for those who are interested in using it, one of the, the key features, aside from just exporting images and, and all these different things, is every time you save a file and every time you export that file, it can be tagged with a, a hash, a git hash, which means that years later you can come back to that same artwork and you can reproduce it exactly, tweak the code, and then reproduce a new artwork from it. So it has this ability to produce uh, different artworks from artworks you've already created. And the whole idea is just bringing the code into this physical space, uh, not just having it so that it's on the screen, although that's totally possible with the tool, but also really uh, enabling you to create prints, to create artworks that are physical and maybe one day hung uh, in a gallery or something like that. Speaking of tangible outputs, hanging things on walls and, and actually being able to, to touch and feel them. Um, just a, a bit of a context. Um, this year is the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus, which is a really cool school that uh, did some beautiful design work. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of beautiful design work that came out of Bauhaus. And one of the students, Annie Albers, I got to see her uh, exhibition at Tate Modern in London recently, and it sort of blew my mind, and it opened me to this world of textiles and fabrics, and uh, the whole idea that uh, textile designers were actually sort of creating systems and rules because the way that weaves would work, you kind of had to lay out the, the fabrics in very specific patterns and very specific orders. So that was really amazing to see and really inspiring. Here's another uh, batch of her work. And one of the interesting things that actually Jessica from Nervous System also talked about yesterday, but uh, one of the interesting things is that the way that uh, many of these textile designers would work is that they would use these jacquard looms. And jacquard looms were fed with these punched cards. And these punched cards would tell the, the loom how to do the weave and how to do the, the pattern and the, the image that you get from the, the textile. 
And these punch cards actually ended up being sort of a precursor to code and computation and computers. This was a really important device in the history of computers because computers originally were fed with punch cards instead of feeding it with JavaScript or Python, which didn't exist at the time. And so there's this kind of like full circle uh, with textile and with code and with computation. And I wanted to just explore that again and, and bring sort of that circle back uh, with JavaScript and with modern code instead of punch cards to reproduce some of these textile designs still within this Bauhaus and Annie Albers sort of style of minimal and colorful. Uh, and I'm really happy to finally like have this as a, as a throw. So I'm collaborating with a, a company called Throw and Co in, in the US. And so just like last week, I got the throws. And there, it's sort of, it just feels full circle, like going back to textile. And so that was really fun, a really fun project to work on. Um, and it's all still using the same Canvas sketch and JavaScript. Uh, so it's all just bringing this, this code into sort of the physical space. Another, uh, another example of bringing this code into physical space would be around uh, risograph printing and other types of printing that are not just ink prints. And so this was a collaboration with a magazine in London. It's like a super tiny magazine, which is totally worth checking out if you're interested in data visualization. They're on their fourth issue, and it's like super, super bespoke and indie. Uh, but they do lots of cool talks and things around data visualization. And they asked me to do the front and back covers. And so what I did was produce this uh, sort of data-driven artwork that's based on the uh, Google Trends for data privacy over the last five years quite a simple concept, but I just wanted sort of something that's basic and simple. Uh, and one of the things that I had a lot of fun doing on this project was figuring out how to set up my code and set up my workflow and my tools uh, so that it would be best suited for their own style of printing this magazine, which is risograph printing. And the way risograph printing works is that you have, uh, you're printing one color at a time. So you'd print the purple or the silver. And so in the final image, on the left, for example, there's this deep purple, and there's white, and there's silver. So the purple is one color, the silver is the other color, and the white is just the paper. It's just the, the color of the paper. So you only have two colors, and so with code, I was able to split this, and I was able to create this system that exports two different, uh, di two different outputs for each color. So that was kind of fun. And then the same concept of exporting multiple layers. This is, again, you can sort of see that subdivision is happening. And this is a silk screen print where I have two different uh, layer masks. I have the, the blue and the red, and they're both exported. Again, JavaScript, Canvas Sketch, but it's sort of just exploring how can I take my code and bring it back into this physical space and actually produce these prints by hand. And so this is screen printing where you create a mask, and the mask is one of the layers, and then you push the ink through the mask. And one of the amazing things about things like risograph and silkscreen is that you get this richness in color. So with risograph, you get these like vivid neons. And with silkscreen, you get these like really rich, rich colors. And it's because you can't really reproduce those kind of colors and that kind of ink with just a regular ink printer. And so when the two colors overlap in a silkscreen print, you kind of get this nice blend mode almost that you can never achieve with something like Photoshop. And you also have these imperfections where sometimes the ink doesn't go through perfectly. And so it just creates this uh, original print from your code that isn't so structured, it isn't so robotic. And it kind of reminds me of uh, why I was so interested in pen plotters with those little tiny imperfections. Uh, sometimes the ink is drying up and it just creates this interesting sort of collaboration where you're collaborating with this machine. And then just a few more examples because um, I'm talking about physical things, but also the whole idea of, of code is that, of course, you can use it for digital things like animations. And so these are all just different exports from the same tool, um, just sort of showing that the tool is capable of lots of things. And this is a little GIF loop. You can imagine like social media branding or something like that. And then as I'm getting into this interactive space and trying to, to do more sort of digital projects, I did a little generative art game which was a super fun project. Um, learned a lot about uh, creating sort of game mechanics. This is all running under 13 kilobytes as part of a game competition. And it's all procedural and it's all generative. And uh, as this kite is flying around and entering these new worlds, uh, each world is, is uh, created totally randomly. So each one is a little bit unique and a little bit different than the last one. And you can play it online on your phone or desktop. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, 
I have a little blog post that details uh, some of the technical challenges, partly getting this whole thing under 13 kilobytes, but also just the idea about uh, how do you use generative code to, to produce a game like this. And the code is actually on GitHub as well. And then uh, this kind of goes back to this original inspiration with Johnny Le Mercier working with light installation. I was um, more and more I'm able to sort of get these kind of uh, experiments and these kind of projects where I'm bringing my code from the browser and from Canvas Sketch or, or JavaScript into this physical space with light and with uh, real installation. So I'll just show you this really short one minute video. So this was a really fun little project to work on. Uh, it was one of many other artists that were also displayed on this, this building, it's this concert hall in Iceland in Reykjavik. Uh, and it already had all these LEDs in the windows, and so the, uh, the people setting up this event, all they needed was a full screen uh, sort of application, or in my case it was just a web page that was just full screen. And so this is me using the same front end techniques that I sort of started with and finally bringing it back into this physical light art installation space that I was so inspired by uh, with Johnny Le Mercier and so on. Uh, and the actual concept, um, I tried to keep pretty simple, but basically when you interact with the, the display, when you interact with the exhibition, it creates these, uh, these thunderstorm lightning sort of strikes. It's a bit of a commentary on um, human interaction and how it affects climate and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just try to uh, sort of end on a slightly more technical note, um, just breaking down the whole start to finish process of a generative print and how that actually looks from, from start all the way through to the, the print phase, um, because there might still be a lot of uh, questions about how do you actually like produce these kind of things and how do you actually create an image from just pieces of code. So here's a sketch that I made. It's part of like a daily sketch series that I was doing in November. Did not do daily sketches. I did like 10 of them and then I stopped. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, based on this prompt reflect. So it, it's not, very, uh, not a very deep artwork. It's just an image. Um, but uh, it started again with Pinterest, just getting a mood and a style and like trying to find what it is that I wanted to sort of uh, reach for, what did I wanted to aim for. So there's this like gradient board that I put together and I'm like, okay, it's gonna have gradients. It's gonna be light and stuff. And then also in November, I just spent like an hour or something or maybe more than that, just trying to come up with words that I felt like kind of evoked something. And this was actually just a really nice and there, like therapeutic thing away from the computer and away from code. So I would recommend doing that. Um, but just prompts that just made me think of images. Uh, and then actually a big thing is just sketching it and putting it down on paper um, before you get into the code, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the time before I started doing this, I was just jumping right into the code and I would just spend hours not even really sure what I was doing, trying to code something. And uh, basically I started to find that, that sketching on paper is a way better way of doing that because you can just sketch something, crumple up the paper and start again and uh, it's much faster. So definitely start sketching. And then this actual image, how does it come about? So. Uh, in this case, I'm using shaders. Uh, there's lots of ways that you could create an image like this, but I'm using shaders, which is like a little tiny uh, computer program that runs on the GPU. And the program is really, really fast. It runs uh, on every single pixel in the image all at once. And so it's really fast. It runs like millions of times in a single second or more. And on Shader Toy, you can find lots of really crazy examples of shaders. Uh, this is just a gradient, but there's many more complex ones. Instead of using Shader Toy, I was using Canvas Sketch, of course, because I'm just always using Canvas Sketch. Um, but it, it's what I use to produce these like high quality prints uh, that are actually like big enough to print, you know, a billboard if I wanted to or something. Um, but here's the image, and how does this work? So it starts with three random points, 
and the three random points are just placed randomly, so every time you run it, you get a totally different output. And then here in the shader, I have to say what's the distance from the current pixel to the first uh, line segment, AB. And then I do the same thing with the second line segment, BC. But instead of just saying what's the distance, I'm going to say what's the distance and divide it by some big number so that it's like spread out nicely. But instead of just dividing it by this number, I'm going to say divide it by a random number. Each time you sample, each, each pixel is going to get a random distance that creates this kind of messiness. Uh, and maybe like cutting one side, but maybe not cutting it entirely, letting some light through. And then adding some color. This is just red, but because it's generative, every time it runs, you get a different color palette. And here it is again. This is all run the same thing, but run it on the second line segment. So now we have the green sort of color palette. And when you add those two uh, numbers together, because we're just in a shader, we're just adding numbers, and it's all just math. When you add those two numbers together, you create uh, an image that looks already kind of like the print. And the last little things would just be to feather the edges. So instead of having such a sharp uh, edge, you feather those edges just by jittering the points and just moving them around every time you sample. And then a few more small details would be super sampling and averaging multiple samples per pixel so that uh, it's a bit less grainy. Here's the super sampling where you render it really big and you scale it back down. And then you add color grading in Photoshop or whatever. And then finally, you just curate uh, all of your, your generative art. So this is a big part of generative art is that you have so many, so many iterations and so many different outputs because it's rendering a different image each time. So a lot of it is just sitting there and kind of going through and finding the best ones. So quite often what I'll do as I'm developing, I'll take like 50 to 100 different exports. And actually, each of those exports could be printed uh, at full resolution. But then I, once I've got like 100 of them or 50 of them, I whittle it down to like four or eight of them that actually I want to print as like the final artworks. But it's nice to take those images along the way because you kind of can create these little uh, chronological videos of, of how you created that system. So it's kind of cool as well. And then uh, the last sort of step would be exporting. This is something that I didn't really realize would take so long until I started doing it. But it's like not something to skip out on is like sizing things and formatting things and all that. Uh, and then actually exporting it to print. It's pretty simple because of the tools that I've built. Uh, they're so much based on exporting for print and exporting for, for physical media that there's not much to be done except maybe some final color tweaks in Photoshop and just sending off the, the file whether it's a, a TIFF file or a PNG or P, uh, PSD or PDF or whatever, sending that file to a print studio and getting back the final prints. And if you're interested, you can check out my, my shop. I now am selling these prints that are all created with JavaScript and code and the same technology I was, I was just talking about. Um, and I'll just end, because I think I have a few minutes. So I'll just end on like the sort of some other ways of getting started. Um, so there's. Uh, a workshop, this is shameless self-promo, but um, yeah, I have a workshop on front-end masters that you can check out, and it's just like how to get started with using Canvas, using WebGL, using 3.js, and JavaScript. Uh, and then also this site is really, really fun uh, and very playful. It's uh, Tim Holman made it, and it's like, it, you, it kind of walks you through how to create uh, different little images using JavaScript and Canvas. So you can sort of see in the top, there's like the Joy Division style image. Um, and then there's also one of the things that uh, he explains is a Vera Molnar piece. So that's kind of full circle back to pen potter work. And that's it. Thanks.